starting first with Marilyn Rousseau um, from the Baptist Health South Florida, um, who is the corporate manager of database operations. She's going to be speaking with us about how to create and sustain high performing remote data teams, which I'm sure we did not expect two years ago would be so important. So looking forward to hearing your ideas here, Marilyn. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Enjoying uh, the conference so far? Yeah, yeah, great. Well, it's great to have you here. Uh, I want to welcome you to this session. My goal is to really make this as interactive as I can. We have a short period of time together. I am not going to use slides because I, I really prefer to have this uh, connection with you. I do have slides, so if at the end you're interested in getting uh, the presentation, I'll show you a way that you can get in touch with me and I'll email it to you. So let's just go ahead and get started. You know, how many of you in this room are in a leadership role? Oh, okay, so that's quite a lot. Now, of those of you who are leaders, are you uh, managing, uh, who, who, how many of you are managing a remote team right now? Okay, that's about half the room. What about just an on, on premise only? One. And how many of you are managing a hybrid combination? Quite a few. So this is our reality, right? Uh, Post-pandemic, it's become very, very common for us to be in a situation where we're working with teams that are, you know, remote, geographically dispersed, as well as on-premise. So this makes the task of managing just a little more challenge, challenging and uh, complicated, I would say, but it's definitely doable. So let me ask you, what would you say are the biggest, maybe top three challenges for you in your role as a leader? Or is everything working perfectly fine? <laughs> yes, go ahead. Maybe the monitoring, monitoring of the uh, information of the flow. Okay, monitoring of the information or of, uh, you know, the work that the, the team's doing. Okay, okay. Yes, go ahead. It's harder to collaborate. Yes, that's a big one. That's a big one. Go ahead. It's harder to Harder to onboard new team members, very common as well. Who else? Miscommunication and lack of alignment. Ooh, <laughs> you just hit it right on the head. All of, all of the above. Those uh, really components make it very challenging to cultivate and manage a team that's producing highly. So today we're going to talk exactly about that. But before we get into it, um, <clears throat> you know, we're going to talk about how we can increase our effectiveness as a leader and create and maintain high-performing teams, right? Whether they're remote or on-premise or a combination. Right, and so the key is to do so and to do it consistently. So, you know, during our time together, I'm gonna share some proven strategies that I have used myself over number of years that I've been managing teams as a lead or, and as a manager. They've worked really well for me. It wasn't always easy, but I really think that uh, these strategies have gotten me to where I am today with my teams which I'm so proud of that perform highly, they work together. And um, you know, because of this, I was able to really put together a, a system that I, I'll be sharing with you today. We're not going to go into depth because we don't have a lot of time. <clears throat> Normally, I teach a course on leadership I, and I also do uh, retreats and different other ways of training where I go in depth with each of these strategies. But what I'd like to do today is just at least share them with you at a high level. And if it turns out you wanna know more or go in deeper, let's just have a talk and then we'll figure out a, a way to help you do that. Before I go on any further, would it be okay if I tell you a little bit about me and what gives me the right to stand here and talk to you? Okay, perfectly, it's perfect. So <clears throat> I'm dating myself, but I've been in the IT industry for 32 years. 
Started out, I'm originally actually from the beautiful island of Haiti, and I moved here to Boston, went to school here, went to UMass, and um, graduated with a degree in computer science. From that point on, I moved to South Florida and started my career. So I have been primarily working in the uh, database uh, sector for probably 25 years of my career. Um, you know, in, of my career. My expertise is in da database development, database administration, working primarily with SQL Server and Oracle. So I started with SQL Server like when Microsoft first bought it from Sybase. That's how far back <laughs> I go. But I've really loved, enjoyed using the tool much more than Oracle. I'm just, be just being honest. And um, really have enjoyed being in that um, in that working in that area and really growing it, and working with other professionals in the data um, field. Now, I have been working with uh, Baptist Health South Florida, which is a huge, the largest uh, healthcare system in South Florida for about 14 years. And I started out as a lead uh, SQL Server DBA and moved it into a leadership role about almost eight years ago, right? Now, I'm overseeing a, a, a team of remote DBAs, and it's been really like this from the beginning. Um, but there were some huge challenges that came with it. You know, when I worked at Baptist, I, I, I'm going to tell it to you just like it is, I had probably the worst manager in my entire career. It was terrible. That's, there's no other way to describe it. And so in how many, in what ways? Well, <clears throat> you know, this particular manager was really a dictator. You know, we weren't allowed to speak our minds. If you said something or, God forbid, you tried to challenge, uh, um, you know, the thinking or perhaps anything that was proposed, you know, you'd get in trouble. I actually got in trouble. <laughs> Um, because I had come from a culture where we openly talk about solutions. And I remember proposing a solution that I don't think my manager really understood. And rather than really being open to it, it, it turned against me. So you might ask yourself, and, and I stayed and worked for that manager for about seven years. So you might ask yourself, why did you stay so long, right? And you're right, a lot of people left. You know, people either left or got fired. And the reason I stayed so long is I, I had a goal. Yeah, I was raising kids. I, I was raising three kids. And, you know, the fact that I could work from home three days a week make, made a big difference for me. And that's the only reason why I stayed, <laughs> you know? Now, how did it go? I was just doing the job. I was not happy. You know, it, like I said, it was a decision that I had made, but I was not growing in that position. I just felt stuck, and I thought that was the price to pay. Now, fast forward, you know, seven years. Like I said, it was an awful experience for all of us, and I don't know why, you know, upper management didn't see it, but eventually they did, and that particular person got fired. Now, guess who got their job? <laughs> Are you looking at her? <laughs> So immediately, you know, because I had the leadership skills, it made it really easy for me. But also, I had gotten really close with my team. And interestingly, my team, they were the one who pushed me <laughs> to step up and go into the position, which made it, you know, a lot easier for me. Because it can get, you know, sometimes a little shady when you have someone moving in from the team, moving into a leadership role. And, you know, it's not always well received. So this worked in my favor. But I inherited a toxic team, as you can imagine, because of the type of leadership that uh, was there for many years. No one trusted anybody. Um, it, a lot of backstabbing was going on. Everybody was afraid of everybody else. You know, it was just awful. And when I became manager, the first thing that I did is I knew I needed to change that. That's not my style. You know, I had great relationship with the team, but I knew that no one trusted anybody, you know? And uh, so I'm going to talk to you about the strategies 
that I used from the very beginning, uh, time that I became a leader uh, till today. So the first thing that I, that I want to mention to you, and I know it may not be what you want to hear, a lot of time we have a tendency to think that the problem is with the team. And not to say that the team does not have their own, you know, individual issues, but, you know, leaders often hire people for their technical skills and their expertise. We have a tendency to just look at what we need them to do. And they come in, the resume looks great, they've got the skill, they're gonna hit the ground running, and we think they're the perfect candidate. But they don't necessarily translate into effective, effective teammates. You know, personality is huge. I always say you can teach the technical skills, but you can't change somebody's personality. They either have it or they don't. So when you bring in somebody who could be a whiz, you know, at what they do, but if nobody can work with them, there's no use to it. It's gonna break down the dynamics within the team and it's going to really affect productivity. So the first thing I wanna talk to you about is the hiring. Be very careful in your hiring practices, right? And I, I know, I've made that mistake myself. I've hired a guy who was just great. Come in, hit the ground running. Nobody could talk to him. <laughs> guy just like he had a chip on his shoulder. People started complaining from day one. It just didn't work. And I realized that I had that, you know, intuition. So again, you have to trust your intuition. I was like, you know, this guy was just, just boasting and talking about his accomplishments, which was great. But that also was my indication that maybe he wasn't such a great team player. You know, somebody's talking I, 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 and it's all about them. Be very careful about that, right? So definitely be careful with your hiring, because once you hire them, then you're stuck with them, and you're gonna try to change them. So it's much easier if you do this from the beginning and you vet who you bring into your team, right? Any questions about that? Okay, the next thing is, you know, learn to lead rather than just occupying a leadership position. And learning to lead really starts with yourself, you know? And that's why I mention a lot of time, we, then, we tend to think that the problem is with the other person. And I remember someone told me, when you point a finger at someone, there's another finger pointing back at you. So in reality, it all starts with you. And you need to be able to lead change within your team with the support of your team. You know, it's crucial for your career advancement as a leader, right? So embrace and be open to continuous learning and growth. Um, you know, humble yourself and be open to learning. Look at your skills, look at the way you're leading, you know. Ask for feedback, you know, and structure your own learning. To me, being a great leader is a continuous, lifelong learning uh, effort. You're always growing, you're always getting better. So first get to know yourself. Examine your own beliefs and your own values around leadership. So for me, it was important to build honesty and trust. So once I became a manager, that was the first thing I was dead set on. You know, this thing about people talking behind it just had to stop. So I focused because it's one of my values that I, I you know, want to be around people that I can trust, that I, you know, that are honest with each other. So that's what was what I decided to work on. Next is to create a team culture, right? Just like organizations have cultures, you, you must create a culture within your team. And ideally, the culture needs to be in alignment with the organizations, because that way we, we really are supporting the greater cause. So you gotta get clear on the structure and the outcome that you want from the beginning, right? What is it that you desire? You know, I focus on creating a team culture from the get-go. So for me, you know, like I said, not, not being able to talk behind anybody's back, you know, I wanted issues to be addressed. 
at team meetings and I wanted people to feel comfortable speaking up without fear of retaliation like we had from the pre previous management. So to do that, it took time, but it was because I, this was a culture that I was dead set on creating. I started patterning it myself and then encouraging it. And eventually they really started to trust that it was okay to speak up and, and share and your opinion without fear of being retaliated against, right? Any questions about that? Great. Number three, psychological safety. You gotta create a safe space where people feel comfortable, and that's what I was talking about, not just the culture, but people need to feel psychologically safe about sharing their thoughts and their ideas, right? Uh, they need to know that they can make a mistake and it won't be ridicule. We all make mistakes. I mean, I've made several mistakes and I'm sure some of you have stories, especially if we work in data, you know, professions. I've had uh, backups that couldn't be restored and uh, caused quite a lot of chaos. So we all make mistakes, but we learn from them, right? So it, it's really about knowing that you can bring your authentic self to work and you will be accepted. You know, even as a leader, when someone makes a mistake, um, they talk about where you praise in public and then you correct in private. So again, you know, uh, uh, remember, you want that person to feel safe so that even when they make the mistake, they're not afraid to tell you about it because that's very important. So be the one to champion that and understand them and take their unique needs into consideration uh, when leading. The next thing is structure. It's very important that, you know, you need to have structure and clarity in your team. So this, it's needed to guide the teams to clearly identify problems and set metrics for success, right? So this means documenting procedures, standards, uh, system configurations, processes, so everyone is clear. So in my team, all of my DBAs manage the same systems and we've got hundreds and thousands of databases. So they all need to be on the same page at any given time. And when it comes to getting our hands, we all need to follow the same standards and so forth. So it's important to have that clearly documented so there are no misunderstandings. And so getting the best out of your data teams requires really a set of practices, including clearly identifying the problem, setting metrics to evaluate the success and taking a close look at the results, right? So what gets uh, improved has to also um, be, you know, uh, you have to follow up on the results so you know where improvement is needed. Uh, doesn't require any technical knowledge, uh, but just a clear understanding of, of the business and how you wanna make an impact on the organization. So they need proper guidance in order to realize their full potential, right? And I think also when everyone understands their roles and their responsibilities, they become a lot more effective. So now be very careful because this can also backfire. If your team is already effective and performing highly, adding more structure and clarity may actually hinder effectiveness. So just you know, gauge where you are and make changes uh, accordingly. Like they say, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Uh, next is, it's important for you to measure the outcomes, not the progress, right? So how many of you would consider yourselves to be micromanagers, if you'll admit to it? <laughs> right, so monitoring your employees' day-to-day -day progress, let me tell you, it will increase anxiety, and it will make them feel that you don't trust them you know, that you have a lack of confidence in their skills. Hopefully, hopefully they're all professionals, you've hired the right people, and you know, while I understand that as a manager, you wanna have the assurance that the employee's getting the work done, especially when they're working remotely, but to me, the focus should be redirected on the outcome. Are they delivering the projects on time and on schedule? Are they participating in the meetings? Are people able to get a hold of them when they need to? If the answer is yes, then leave them alone. 
leave them alone. It doesn't work, you know, to, to you for you to go and see how long they've been on the computer. It doesn't mean anything. They could just be sitting there and just letting time. So measure performance, measure outcomes, not progress. Okay. The big one, and again, I wish I could ju just like, I have a course on just communication alone, right? Communication is probably 90% of the solution to creating high performing teams. I can't emphasize it enough. It is, it's a key strategy to managing your teams. So it's essential to build trust. It builds transparency to encourage dialogue and also, it, it, it's important to communicate about work updates, schedule, and it's so, so crucial. You know, in my team, I have, uh, we use SharePoint, where I share communication. I have a calendar where I put everybody's schedule, who's out on PTO. So at any given time, the team can go and see who's where, who's doing what, all right, as well as the, the on-call calendar, like we really need to have, think of that and create a common, a common repository to communicate and share documents. Set up regular one-on-ones with your employees. Don't wait until performance evaluation to tell them about something they're not doing right. Trust me, they'll be pissed. You know, if, if nip it in the bud is what I say. If there's something happening, get, you know, have a call with them right then and there and take care of it. Don't let it escalate. It really takes courage, you know, and, and for me that was a big thing because I don't really, you know, like to scold people in any way, you know, I like to be nice, but in reality, you're not helping your team grow if you're not being honest with them about where, you know, they may need to, to put a little more effort. So get to know yourself and your team develop insight into how your own way of thinking and um, reacting really interact with, with the employees. And um, you know, one important thing I wanna say is, I always talk about bringing humanity back to technology, is remember before systems and all, we're dealing with humans. These are people who have families, who have issues at the house, who may be dealing with illnesses, marriage situations. So it's important to be cognizant of that. They're coming into the work and bringing it with them, whether we like it or not. So, you know, give people a chance, get to know them, talk about, you know, ask them about their families, about their dogs. That may, makes them feel that they matter. You know, it's important and do it authentically, you know, but really spend time and show people a little bit of empathy. It goes a long way, I'm telling you. Now we gotta move. Okay, so we talked about building trust. So communication is key and part of communication is really building trust. How do you do that? Well, constant, constant communication, open, honest, transparency is huge. You know, let them know what's happening at all time. Copy them in the emails, okay? Schedule calls to share information. I, I do that even with rumors that are going around the company. I schedule a call to talk about it. And I'm honest, you know, they know I won't lie to them. If it's something that I know, I'll share. If I can't share, I'll tell them, hey, you know, I'm not allowed to share. So again, it's about honesty. And vulnerability. Again, we're humans, you don't know everything. And, and it's okay to you know, talk about your own struggles and your own challenges. I remember there was a time not a few years ago, um, I'm a breast cancer survivor and I was out of work for a good year. And it was a tough time in my life. And I talked to my team about it, they knew, but as a result, they became extremely supportive. I mean, I spent a whole year pretty much managing my team from home and they performed highly. There were no degradation in their performance. I mean, these guys just continued to carry on. And I, I knew they were doing it because they wanted to support me and they knew that I didn't have a whole lot of time and they wanted me to be carefree. But why? It's because, you know, I planted the seed. I treated them well. When they needed me to understand their own struggles, I, I was able to do that. And so you, it's important to create that relationship so that we support each other. Quickly is, um, 
Oh, this is a big one, diversify your team. You know, you all hear about the buzzword, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and actually that's something that's pretty near and dear to my heart. I sit on the board of the um, Society for Information Management, uh, South Florida organization as the chair of diversity and inclusion. And I can't emphasize enough the importance of it, right? We all know by now, we've seen the research, it shows that when you build diverse teams, you know, you create much better outcomes. So don't be afraid to, you know, be able to, to really diversify your team. And it's not just, you know, race and gender, it's about, you know, uh, mental ability, um, you know, and, and a number of other, um, other, how would I say, factors that come in, in, in really important here. So we gotta learn to promote equality, inclusivity to prevent, um, you know, the teams from, def especially when you're leading hybrid teams, you don't want your team to feel like isolated as subgroups. So maybe this team is close, this team is close, but together they're not really working each other. So be very aware of that, you know. Team members, treat them equally and fairly, regardless of uh, who they are. Show empathy, right? Make sure workers, are connected to each other. And um, you know, the list can go on and on, but please, please uh, take this very importantly. And lastly, work-life balance. That, I'm sure it speaks for itself, right? Work is important, but to me, family is way more important than work, and that's what I tell my team. So create time not just for them, but for you too. Be an example. Create time to do the things you love, the things that fulfill you. Respect your employees' time off with their family. I don't call my team unless there's really an urgency, right? Avoid emailing them late at night or calling them during off hours if it's not urgent. And if you choose as a manager to work on Friday nights, that's you, but make it clear that you don't expect them to do the same. Because employees, they look at what you do and they do what you do. Right? So be very cognizant of that and do everything you can to help them create that balance and have respect for their personal time. Right? So if you want to become an expert at leading team, the best place to start really is first by understanding the way that to progress and understanding yourself, understanding what needs to shift inside of you. And you do that by knowing yourself, by being honest with yourself, and role in training if you need to, work with a coach, whatever you need to do to hone in your leadership skills. Because the better leader you are, the better you'll be able to lead your team. So, if you would like to, again, like I said, this, this is, uh, you know, my time's up, so if you'd like to know more or you want to have a discussion, I'm going to be here the rest of the day as well as tomorrow, so let's chat. Uh, if you'd like to connect with me, a quick way to do so is to grab your phones and go to Maryland360.com. So, you can do it now, Maryland360.com, and you can connect with me just send me a text or um, you can save my contact. All of my social media handles are there. And I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear about your successes and your challenges with your teams. I'm always uh, something interested and I'm sure I can learn more. So I wanna say that it's been an honor and a privilege to be here and present to you today. I'd love to support you, like I said, uh, with your own leadership journey. Enjoy the rest of the conference and I'll see you around. All righty, thank you so much, Marilyn. I think that gives us a lot to think about and a lot to directly apply in the next weeks and months on our teams. Um, 
So the next talk is just 15 minutes, so that's why we're moving things along. We have Vincent Lam from C Data, who's going to be talking with us about accelerating the move to the cloud um, with real-time connectivity. Um, the VP of Marketing and Strategy from C, C Data. Welcome, Vincent. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, everyone. I know that I am the thing standing between you and lunch, so we are going to make this go smoothly, and we're going to make it a lot of fun. Uh, as I'm setting up here, uh, anybody know what ETL stands for? Extract, 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 extract what? Transform load. Very good. How about ELT? Extract, load, transform. Right. How about ELF? Nothing, that's just a mythical creature with sharp ears. But uh, now, now that the computer's up, okay. All right, well, hey, it's, it's real nice to, to see all of you and uh, welcome to the Data Summit. Thanks for uh, joining the session. Really excited to talk to you about a real life case study about uh, connectivity in the cloud. How many of you right now are on that journey? How many of you are either in it or have done it or are in the process of moving to the cloud, right? And I see a bunch of hands uh, raised. And so it's a, it's a journey that a lot of companies take. Um, obviously, the cloud is a pretty important part of um, how companies are interacting, how they host infrastructure, and how they save on costs. So today, we're going to take a closer look at that journey. Sometimes the journey, um, it's got it can have bumps, right? It's, it's not the smoothest journey. Sometimes we think about it as lifting and shifting, and we kind of imagine in ourselves that we're just taking whatever we had before and just plopping it down to this thing in the cloud, and it should just magically work. Now, sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. So let's talk a little bit about Office Depot. If you're not familiar with them, they're a leading provider of, of business services, products, and digital workplace technology, odds are you've probably seen one of their stores. And so they have about 1,100 of them um, you know, across the world, and they have the same goals that we just discussed about. They are looking to find a way to move themselves into the cloud. They had a legacy data warehouse, and they said, you know what, for all those reasons we just talked about, we'd like to get to the cloud. Now, the strategy was pretty simple. They were going to lift and shift, right? They were going to take the same data, the same infrastructure, and just find the equivalent in the cloud and hopefully everything would work. Now unfortunately, that's not always true. In this case, it wasn't. Uh, what they found was that there are hiccups. Uh, one of the big hiccups is even though you've had the opportunity to move your, your transition, your infrastructure to the cloud equivalent, uh, some of the things you run into you know, are really quite tangible. Uh, and a big one was inaccessible data. Now, I know it sounds weird. You would say to yourself, I'm going from a data warehouse to a data warehouse. How could I not be able to access, access my data? But it happens. And, and in fact, in this particular case, the principal reason was that as part of their transition, as you can see from the logos there, they went to Snowflake as their data warehouse of choice. Great. And they had existing work, existing analytics that they've already built and spent hours on, you know, many, 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 um, you know, man hours, woman hours, building the suite of analytics in SSAS, right? SQL Server Anal Analysis Services. And it was unusable. They, they lifted and shifted and it just didn't work. And so the, the huge investments that they put into these cubes for analytics, again, for nothing. And as they started to evaluate what they could do, they started to run into this impasse, right? You know, we could start all over again and lose all the work that we'd built and, and you know, and, and, and really start from scratch, but you, you don't really get any of the benefits there, right? You, you essentially are doing things twice, which defeats the whole purpose. So fortunately, there was a way to solve it, and that's what we're anchoring our conversation on today. It's this idea that if you can leverage some sort of standard Maybe there's a way here that we can do this transparently. Maybe there's a way here that we can overcome this technical hurdle and make things work again. So before we go into detail about what that is, you know, the truth of the matter is this is not unique. I think, uh, you know, when I talk to customers, prospects, and, uh, industry peers, and probably people like yourselves, uh, we find this problem happening an awful lot. Uh, you know, connectivity is just a challenge. It really is, even when you're going from like to like. So why does that happen? Well, here's just a sampling of logos that you probably run across, and there are many more, right? And what we've always encountered, and, and you've encountered, is that things work differently, right? Uh, the way that you interface with different um, applications or data sources differ. 
right? And sometimes you're dealing with things that have a stretch between something quote unquote legacy that you've had forever and something that was just released a year ago. And so we've got really three principal challenges that we all contend with here. One is that everything is isolated. Every single little logo is its own repository of knowledge and data and wealth that you need to get to. So, uh, and, and that, of course, makes getting to all of it pretty difficult. Secondly, when you try and address each of these, how do you talk to each of these? They, again, they all do it differently. Some of them might have an API that you call, right? Some of them might go through maybe SQL. Uh, some of them might only have a front end. Right, the sky's the limit. There's every permutation out there. And then what's the answer? Well, <laughs> if the answer is IT, you're in trouble because IT doesn't scale that way, right? There are only, you know, usually 10 fingers and 10 toes on, on, on the average human being. And so 24 hours and, and, you know, you add it all up and as much as you try and be agile and make the most of this, it's not scalable. So we need to find a better way to do this. We need to find a way to be able to tackle all of this complexity, but maintain the benefits of all those things that we want to use and all the information that we need to get to. So that's where this idea of standards-based connectivity comes in. It's the idea that if we could somehow, some way, connect to all these different things in a consistent way in real time, then you know what? That might just make our lives a little bit easier. So. Here's an example, right? If you look at this diagram up here, it's just a random sampling of tools you might be using, right? And the only common thing I would say about them is that these are tools that most enterprises run in one shape or some shape or form, right? It could be an analytics or BI platform, maybe you're using Power BI or Tableau or something or Tipco, right? Uh, it could be an ML or AI platform where you're starting to explore that. It could be a, a host of data products if you're doing governance, if you're doing master data management, data quality, data profiling. I see ears perking, right? I'm hitting all the buzzwords here. And of course, you've got operational systems, right? The things that make your business go. All those different things interact with data. All those different things that we've just discussed need data to operate properly and have people that have requirements and business users that need to be able to do all this now. So it's funny, if you think about it, it's kind of a problem we've kind of solved before. Now, what do I mean by that? So if we look over at the structured world, and not everything is structured, but if we looked over at the structured world, we'd see that, you know what, there kind of is a underpinning that exists today to communicate with, let's say, different databases, right? Different structured repositories, right? So it just so happens that there's this language that was created, a beautiful, SQL, right? Structured query language that gave us and gives us today this consistent way to, to, to query data in a way that is consistent from vendor to vendor or item to item. And that's great, but the problem is, you know, those logos alone probably take up, you know, the vast majority of that market. And again, we saw that the logos that we deal with day in and day out don't fall under that category, right? They are all these different applications and systems on premises, in the cloud, and trying to get them all to be uh, consistent and work together is an impossibility because they are fractured, they are different, they do interact differently with the rest of the enterprise. But here's the thing. We need them and they're valuable. So, you know, if you're following along and your mental gears are spinning, you're probably thinking to yourself, okay, I think I know where he's going with this, right? I can kind of see that blue bar on the left and I say to myself, if he were just to pull that bar all the way to the right, wouldn't that kind of solve some of this problem? Yeah, it does. <laughs> so if we were to now magically say, you know what, let's take this beautiful thing called SQL, which we have tools that speak out of the box, we have personnel that speak, that's relatively, speak out of the box with it, right, even data scientists, uh, and we enabled the world to just be able to function in this standard way, regardless of what that thing on the right is. That thing on the right might not be a database. It might be an online application. It might have zero schema, okay? There would be no concept of a table there. But what if somehow we made it work? What would that do for us? Well, 
as you can see in that diagram, what that really means is every single tool, investment, and person that was able to speak SQL before is now that much more productive and can now tap into that wealth of information and skill set that they have and they can make all of that work without refactoring, without knocking on IT's door to try and get things together. So how do we do this magic? Well, you know, obviously I'm a little biased here. I work for a company that does this for a living. And so the way that, that, that we've approached it and, and the way that this ties into what Office Depot has done is they've taken that key technology and they've made that work. And what do I mean by that? So again, it's really simple. The application, the person themselves don't see a difference. So you're not changing a thing. You are literally just pointing that arrow that says I was talking to this database or this source and I'm pointing out the C data one, that's it. But behind the covers, there's that magic, right? It doesn't matter if the system on the right never had any sort of SQL interface, it had a specific API that was really custom and it changes every year, <laughs> it doesn't matter, right? You just have to understand that you just point at that, that, that layer in the middle, that the application speaks SQL and everything will just work. So. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the guts of this because I think it's really here to appease some of the techies in the room, which I know they exist here. So there's a little more than just you know fairy dust here. There's uh, a lot of technology that's built to make this happen in such a way that's really organic and easy. And so one of the things, for instance, just as a highlight, is that each of these universal connectors we're talking about has a built-in SQL engine. There is a custom SQL engine built into every single one of these things. That's part of how the magic works because we're talking about SQL. And in order to be able to function that way, it actually is able to take all the standard SQL commands that would come out of a BI reporting tool, out of your analytics or anything else, translate that seamlessly, optimize the performance, and then do a query and a join against all these different sources that you have without any issue. It's pretty cool. So. You know, I, I think the way to wrap this up is I started the story off with a problem. And I said, hey, this is Office Depot. They want to lift and shift to the cloud. Here's, here's what they ran into and here's their approach. But I guess the best way to end the story is with kind of the punchline. What happens, you know, what happens before the story ended? And the results, fortunately, were good. They're really good. Um, you know, this gentleman from Office Depot, an IT architect, said basically that the standards-based real-time connectivity uh, allowed them to take that snowflake data and put it into a cube with that sub two second response time that their end users were looking for. See, th that's the best outcome. When you can do a lift and a shift, and things work and they work fast, right? They work better, right? That is, that is exactly what you hope for when you take a huge endeavor like that in things like moving to the cloud. So a couple other quick highlights as I know we're winding down here. Uh, and before I jump to those, just to make it clear, um, Office Depot is an amazing use case, right? Because this is just the one that a lot of people are running into. But if you just take a moment to extend that, right? I mean, I know you don't all work for Office Depot. I know you don't all use SSAS. I know probably some of you are using Snowflake for sure. But the concept is the same. It's the ability in real time to get to the data you need, no matter where it is, using your existing tools. So. If we kind of break that down a little further in terms of some of those results, again, I'm really a, personally a sucker for a good quote, so I, I cheated. I put another one up here, right? I, I, and because it's really, you know, it's straight from the source. It's from the person that had the problem, right? And this is a different person, an IT manager at Office Depot. And they said that, you know, the standards-based connectivity we're talking about offered a drop-in replacement. Th th those are magic words, right, in the land of IT. A drop-in replacement, nothing had to be redesigned. We could simply reconfigure the cubes to get them working. It was literally just click, 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 and things started to work. Um, some of the key results, again, there's, if you actually really want to know more about this, I didn't prepare all that for, for this 15 minute talk, but if there's a case study I can give you, email me, happy to share it with you. Uh, but simply put, this enabled them to transition over to Snowflake, movement to the cloud really seamlessly. Right, things didn't break. They were able to move the data and their applications can now work. Uh, rapid time to value, again, in under four weeks, everything was up and going, which is amazing in the land of IT as we all know. Uh, performance, I mean, isn't that great when you can do all this and things improve? 10 to 10x performance increase, right, which is terrific. 
Um, and, you know, of course, from a business perspective, they're able to now do the things that they needed to do, right, which was in their line of business, monitoring real-time performance and fill rate, right, having real retail scorecards for each store and, and being able to track sales performance, you know, dynamically as they needed to, and allowing their merchandising departments to be able to find, build these, you know, detailed financial sales and market basket analyses, all using the, the, the framework and the software that they already had, but now improved with their move to the cloud. So 15 minutes, I promised you, and if I'm looking at my clock, it is exactly 15 minutes. So this is what I'll do. Uh, I'm going to end my talk here. I don't have any more slides. I, thank goodness it worked out. Anybody that's super hungry, enjoy your lunch. Any of you that want to hang out just for a couple of minutes, I'll be up here. Happy to talk to you, and uh, thank you so much. And by the way, we are here at the conference, so if those two time slots don't work, drop by our booth. We'll be happy to talk to you there. Thank you.